Part 1. What have you been up to? I've just been to a tutorial. Weren't you two supposed to attend? Yes, we were. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi there, Sang Min. What have you been up to? I've just been to a tutorial. Weren't you two supposed to attend? Yes, we were. But I had an essay to finish and Julianne offered to help. Did we miss much? Well... I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, it was all about spending habits among undergraduates. It was based on uh, recent research done by a PhD student studying behavioral psychology. Oh, yes. I remember being interviewed by him about what I usually spend my money on. Uh, and what did you say? Well, most of my money, probably around 75%, goes on basic living. Uh, paying rent, food costs, and, of course, university fees. I'm the same, except my food bill is higher. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in the same boat here. Mm, virtually all my money goes on that, too. But I also spend a lot of money on textbooks, between 100 and 120 pounds a month, usually more. Realistically, it's closer to 150 pounds. <laughs> that explains why you get such good marks. <laughs> Another aspect of the interview was students' use of credit cards, with a particular focus on how students manage these. In my case, not very well. <laughs> I always end up spending more than I plan to. It's too easy to use. Mm. Surely that must be the point, that students are given credit cards too easily before they've learned how to use them. And the number of credit cards some students get, it's frightening. The average is about three cards. Not only cards. Students need to learn how to manage money, too. And this is what the interviews meant to find out. By comparing and contrasting all the data, the root causes of student spending could be highlighted. And the effects this has on students, I'd imagine, would be more negative than positive. Perhaps, but this was the other part of what the student was trying to achieve. You also need to study the effects to find answers. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. But I think it all goes back to how we were taught to manage money when we were children. That's true. Our behaviour now is closely related to the childhood environment and what we learned from that. But how far back should we go? When do children really begin forming an understanding of what money means? I've read that children between three and five can understand what's right and wrong. That's when they can learn concepts like sharing. At the age of six, most children can understand the value of money. This suggests that if parents offered practical advice to their children at an early age, it could have a very positive impact on their spending habits in later life. Mm. It basically comes down to three areas. The first one is allowance. Parents should not try to focus on how much money they give their children, but rather on what they need. Needs are difficult to define, so parents need to resist the urge to give in when their children say, I want. Mm. For me, the only way to teach children the difference between needs and wants is to give them a practical allowance. 
If my parents had not done that for me when I was younger, I don't think I would be able to handle the money they give me now.、Mm, true. The second thing I think is important is saving. Can you explain a bit more? Well, basically, parents need to introduce their children to personal finance. If we are expected to deal with money now, then we have to learn when we are younger. I see what you mean. And it could be in quite simple ways, like by helping them to open their own savings account.、Mm. There's one more area I think is vital. What's that? It's buying. We spend excessively on credit cards because we don't know how to control money. We almost need to learn how and what to buy, which is why parents should allow their children to participate in this. If they want something expensive, like A new pair of trainers, then they could be encouraged to save a bit of their allowance. And parents could also promise to help by saying that they will pay the rest if the child, at the end of their period of saving, still does not have enough. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a radio program for people who live abroad. Listen and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Listen and answer questions eleven to seventeen. You're listening to Expat News, a weekly broadcast for the English-speaking community in this great city. In today's program, we'll be hearing from Tom O'Hara, who's going to tell us about all those different associations he can join. Tom. Good evening. Yes, in a city with so many of its residents born outside the country, it's hardly surprising there's such a huge range of expatriate clubs and societies, and many of these, of course, are aimed at English speakers. So, first and perhaps most obviously, we have the sports clubs, which in some cases field teams in things like rugby and tennis that compete against clubs in other parts of the country or even abroad. You don't have to play at this level to have fun, though. They can be just a great way to do some exercise, and of course, to get to know other people, especially if you're new in town. The same can be said of the many hobby and interest clubs that have sprung up here. Everything from landscape photography, such as the Viewfinders Club in the Harbour District, or focus on the airport road, to old favourites like stamp collecting. Remember that this country has a long tradition of unusual and perhaps even eccentric societies, so there should be something for everyone—a place where you can meet people of different nationalities with the same social and/or cultural interests as you. For those who may be interested in rather more than just friendship, there's a wide range of lively social clubs. Several singles associations organise dancing of various kinds. While for people in a real hurry, there's speed dating, in which everyone talks to everyone else for just five minutes. Then at the end, they decide which of them they would like to meet again by ticking their names on a list. In complete contrast to these are the many religious associations, reflecting the diversity of faith groups present in this multicultural city. Many of them, of course, have their own places of worship. Perhaps also of interest to those who've come here from other parts of the world are the international and cultural societies. These often provide a meeting place for people from a specific country, China, for instance, and particular ethnic groups such as Afro-Caribbeans. 
As in other major cities, we have here local branches of many charities with names familiar around the world. Meetings of human rights organisations like Amnesty International are held regularly in English, as are those of environmental groups such as Greenpeace. All funds raised, by the way, go to the same kinds of good cause as they do in other countries you may have lived in. Inevitably, perhaps, there are also the political clubs, often connected with a particular party and, indeed, a particular country. So we have, for example, a local association of Republicans linked to and campaigning for that party in the US, and Liberal Democrats here doing the same for their party in Britain. Finally, on a lighter note, there's plenty to choose from in the performing arts. Whether you enjoy taking part or just watching and listening, you can take your pick from a whole range of groups. To take just a couple of examples, there's light opera at the Memorial Hall in the city centre, or a very lively amateur theatre company in the Park District. In summer, they give open-air performances of Shakespeare plays, free of charge. Now answer questions 18 to 20. Now answer questions 18 to 20. I should mention at this point that clearly some districts have a higher concentration of English-speaking clubs than others, and that certain parts of town tend to specialise in particular activities. An obvious example would be the number of water sports clubs down near the river. Whatever the number, though, they usually have one thing in common – with the exception of a few associations linked to particular countries and supported by their embassies here, in the vast majority of cases, it is the individual members who fund them, so an entry fee or a subscription will be charged. You may be used to council-subsidised sports centres and the like in your home country, but I'm afraid that's not the case here. Assuming you can afford it, then, you can be fairly sure that somewhere out there you'll find a club that caters for your own particular fascination. If it's very important to you and you intend to spend a lot of time on it, it might even determine which district of the city you decide to live in. In the unlikely event that you really can't find such a club, the solution is to try to persuade friends and anyone else you meet of the need for one. You could also use the local small ads on the internet to suggest the idea. You'll be amazed at just how many people share even the strangest interest. Then you can start your own. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Dr. Simons. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, as I said, there were three areas of interest, so perhaps we should take each in turn. Fine. Let's take the medical and physical evidence first. Hmm. Well, 
First of all, life expectancy. Although some very old individuals were encountered, the Ramesses is a case in point. He was probably over ninety. It seemed the average Egyptian died rather young, from about thirty to thirty-five years old, on the whole. Although the nobility, as might be expected, tended to live longer, some of them have been found to be fifty or sixty years old. Well, naturally, the older they got, the more medical problems were encountered. But some modern disorders have so far not been found. There is no evidence yet of any malignant tumours, for example. Although the fact that most people studied were comparatively young could account for this. Another modern problem, dental decay, was also absent, probably due to the plain diet and absence of sugar. There was another problem with teeth caused by this diet. The stones on which their flour was ground caused a lot of grit to get into the bread. And this eroded the teeth so much that many older people must have suffered greatly and could have been confined to a liquid diet. An abscess on the jaw caused by this kind of erosion may, in fact, have contributed to the death of Ramesses the Second. Analysis of the internal organs of several mummies has revealed that intestinal parasites were common, even among the upper classes. Evidence of a generally low standard of public hygiene. And another widespread disorder was a form of anemia. Naturally, the ancient Egyptians didn't smoke, but、uh, lesions on the lung were widespread. These, however, are the sort that we associate today with workers in mines and quarries, and must be due, in the case of Egyptians, to living in sandy desert conditions. Actually, on the smoking issue, there was a temporary sensation when traces of what appeared to be tobacco were found in Ramesses's sarcophagus. But、uh, botanists later confirmed that it was not, in fact, tobacco itself, but a related plant which is native to Egypt. In the meantime, cynics were commenting that it probably had come from the cigarette of some careless Egyptologist or museum attendant of the past. Ha ha! And what about their physical appearance? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Well, what would you expect from seeing Egyptian art? They were light and slight in build. The average height for both men and women was about one meter sixty, and、um, studies of the skeletons from which the covering of flesh can be extrapolated suggest that they weighed much less in relation to their height than most modern people. From about ten to fifteen kilograms, less than someone of a similar height today is the estimate. And what about mummification? Ah,、uh, well, the first thing to be said is that it wasn't always done in the same way, and it was by no means infallible, as many people tend to think. Many bodies, including that of the famous King Tutankhamun, were also entirely destroyed by overuse of one or another of the substances generally employed. The basic procedure was much the same, however. Most of the internal organs, including the brain, were removed and preserved separately in a jar. The brain was got out through the nose using a sort of hook. Oh dear! Yes, it used to be thought that the heart was always removed too, but in the case of Ramesses, it was found in place. The body was then immersed in a substance called natron. That's a form of sodium carbonate. Which occurred naturally in Egypt, for forty to seventy days. It was then washed, made up, and wrapped in linen bandages and placed in its coffin or sarcophagus. Then it was soaked in oils, resins, and perfumes to help preserve it further. You said the body was made up. Do you mean its face was painted? Yes, yes. Ramesses was not only made up; they had to restructure his nose, which was damaged when they took out his brain. The investigators found that it had been stuffed with small animal bones and、uh, peppercorns of all things. His hair had been dyed too. 
You said that Ramesses had suffered other adventures after his death. Ah, well, yes, poor chap. Well, for a start, he was found in a much later tomb than his real date. Along with a lot of other pharaohs, it looks very much as if the priests of later times had moved and reburied him to save him from tomb robbers. His body was transported along with the other pharaohs found in the same tomb to the Cairo Museum. That was in 1871, and it was put on display. Well, naturally, removed from the dry desert atmosphere, his body started to deteriorate, and by the 1970s was in very poor state. That was part of the reason why the Egyptian authorities gave their consent for its temporary removal to Paris for study. Yet another upheaval. The French experts aim not only to carry out an investigation, but were also able to apply the latest techniques of restoration and conservation. So that at the end of the study, Ramesses was specially treated and then rewrapped in new bandages. Well, they weren't exactly new, since they were of ancient Egyptian date. Given a new sarcophagus and carefully transported back to Cairo, where he is now kept in a controlled environment, which should slow down the deterioration process. So, as I said at the beginning, not only was science served, but a proper respect was paid to the remains in the end. Exactly. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Hear a lecture. Questions 31 to 40 are based on the lecture. Before you listen, please look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Urban and community forestry can make great differences in our lives. Each one of us can make a personal contribution. As we develop and apply technologies for a better way of life, oftentimes side effects adversely affect our natural environment. For example, in our urban areas, summer temperatures and noise levels are higher than in surrounding countryside. Air pollution problems are more concentrated and the landscape is significantly altered, reducing personal health benefits available to us by reducing access to wooded areas and green open spaces. Trees help solve these problems. Now, 75% of us live in cities and towns and we can act individually to improve our natural environment through planting and care of trees on our own streets and by supporting community-wide forestry programmes. Through technology, we are learning more about trees and how they benefit mankind and how we can do a better job of planting and caring for these trees that make up our urban forests. Trees are major capital assets in Australia's cities and towns, just as streets, sidewalks, sewers, public buildings and recreational facilities a part of a community's infrastructure, so are publicly owned trees. Trees, and collectively the urban forest, are important assets that require care and maintenance, the same as other public property. Trees are on the job 24 hours every day, working for all of us to improve our environment and quality of life. Without trees, the city is a sterile landscape of concrete, brick, steel and asphalt. Picture your town without trees. Would it be a place where you would like to live? Trees make communities livable for people. Trees add beauty and create an environment beneficial to our mental health. Trees impact deeply on our mood and emotion, providing psychological benefits which are impossible to measure. A healthy forest growing in places where people live and work 
is an essential element of the health of the people themselves. A well-managed urban forest contributes to a sense of community pride and ownership. Trees and other plants make their own food from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, water, sunlight and a small amount of soil elements. In the process, they release oxygen for us to breathe. Trees remove gaseous pollutants by absorbing them through the pores in their leaf surface. Particulates are trapped and filtered by leaves, stems and twigs and washed to the ground by rainfall. Air pollutants injure trees by damaging their foliage and impairing the process of photosynthesis. They also weaken trees, making them more susceptible to other health problems, such as insects and diseases. The loss of trees in our urban areas not only intensifies the urban heat island effect from loss of shade and evaporation, but we also lose a principal absorber of carbon dioxide and trapper of other air pollutants as well. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.